So let's turn to the book of Revelation, but let me pray first. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we come before your presence tonight, and I thank you, God, Lord, um, for the blood of the Lamb. I thank you, God, that you cover us, you wash us clean, Lord, that we can enter into the Holy of Holies tonight, Lord God. You said when two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are in the midst of us, Lord. And God, we long for your presence. Lord, we need to hear from you. God, we need a touch from you, Lord. Your people, not just here, God, but all over the world, Lord. Your people need a touch from you. So I ask, oh God, for an outpouring, a fresh outpouring, and a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit upon all of your people tonight, Lord God. Every person who chooses to draw near to you tonight, Lord God, I pray pray that you would meet them, that you would meet us, Lord God, and that you would encourage us, Lord God, and that you would strengthen us and build us up, Father, Lord, and open up our eyes to see what you see, Lord God, and our ears to hear what you hear, Lord. God, we don't want to hear what the world is saying, God. We don't need to hear what the news is saying, God. We want to hear from heaven, Lord God. We want to hear from the Holy Spirit, Lord. So I pray, Lord God, that you would magnify your word, my God. Let it reach to the depths of our hearts, my God, and I pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we give you the glory in your mighty, matchless, precious name. Amen. So the title of the message that the Lord has um, just spoken to me and really put on my heart to share tonight is, is called The Woman and the Dragon. The Woman and the Dragon. And we are going to be reading from Revelation chapter 12 tonight. But before I get into that scripture, I just want to give a short illustration, um, just for context sake, right? Just so we can have a picture of, um, a practical picture or a practical example of the current situation in an easy way to understand. So recently, um, and I didn't, I didn't come up with the first part of this myself, but recently I heard an illustration likening these present times to a train, and so I want to expound on this train just for a little bit, okay? Because if you're in New York, for those who live in New York, for those who are listening, you are familiar with the subway station, right? You're familiar with the train tracks and when you get on the subway, how there's different stops and you can see um, the, all the different stops, right, on the subway. So when you get on the train, there are two trains in this station. Only two trains. And both have completely different destinations, okay? So one is going north and the other is going south. And so this situation, I mean this station or where these trains are headed are completely different, but this station represents this current world or the earth. One train is an earthly train or the train of the world and it goes around its tracks, it just keeps on going around its tracks but its final destination is eternal separation, death, and destruction. Now, the second train is a heavenly train. But on this train, the earth is just a stopover. Because this train has a final destination that goes to heaven. And on this train, it's a one-way ticket. It's a one-way destination. And on this train, this heavenly train, there is only one way to get a ticket on this train. And it's through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging you are a sinner, turning to him by faith and repenting from your sin. So this heavenly train, you don't have to pay, right? But this other train, the earthly train, the co there is a cost, right? You have to pay. Like the Metro card is going higher. Like every year they raise the prices for the Metro card. So on one train, there is a cost. But on this other second train, this heavenly train, there's a free ticket that the Lord Jesus Christ paid for himself with his blood. 
And now these two trains are seemingly on the same track. At first they're going, it seems like they're going on the same track. But soon these two trains are going to split. The final destination of the heavenly train is to be with our Lord Jesus Christ in his heavenly kingdom. But this other train of the world leads to death, it leads to hell, and it leads to destruction. But the Lord offers this entrance to this heavenly train for free. And you know, when, you, like I said, when you're on the subway, you see the various stops, right? It tells you 34th Street, then 23rd Street. And so you see how many stops, and you count how many stops left to your final destination. And so on this heavenly train, given the biblical uh, context and prophetic context of what we're living in, On this heavenly train that the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ are in, there are only a few stops left. So imagine you're on a train, or I often ride the, used to ride the F train, right? And you're going to your final destination, let's say 23rd Street, you have and you're counting, there's four stops left before you get there. And so where this train, where these two trains are headed, it seems like it's going in the same direction. Right, And when you're looking at the train map, you see there's only a few stops left on this train before the end, before the end of the stop. And so where we are right now on this spiritual train ride, there's only a few stops left on this train. Okay? And you know how, how many know sometimes you get off a stop too early? And then when you get off a stop of the train too early, you get lost. Right? Sometimes you fall asleep and you miss your train. Sometimes you get off the track and then you take the wrong train and then you go in a different direction. Okay? And so the enemy is right there on the subway station and he wants you to get off of this heavenly train and get you on the other train that's headed to destruction. And so how does he do that? Right? He steals, he kills, he destroys through lukewarmness, through complacency, through sin, through compromise, through whatever it is. He wants you off of that train. And he wants to keep you from putting other people on this heavenly train with you. Okay? And sometimes you get off the track, you get off the the train too easily or too early. And so you're on this wrong train for a little while. But then you realize, and the Holy Spirit causes you to realize, get back on the right train. Okay? Because there's only a few stops left to the final destination of where the church is headed to. There's only a few stops left to the final destination of both where these trains are headed to. And you want to make sure that you are on the right train ride. You want to make sure that you are not going in the wrong direction. Okay? And the enemy sometimes, he wants you to get off of the train, to distract you, go on the wrong train. Or sometimes, you know, you're unfortunately, we're hearing all of these... Um, terrible news stories about people getting pushed off the tracks and these different distractions. So the enemy would love nothing more than to keep you and get you off of this train to where your final destination is through distraction, through the wrong train to get you on the worldly train. But the other train is not going in the same direction. It seems like it is, right? But it's headed to destruction. It's headed to hell. But the Lord gives us free access to this heavenly train through his blood. He paid our ticket. He played the ticket. Okay. And so now we are on the end time train. As I've heard it before. This train is only going one way. As we've heard in the word of God. As we've heard that the birth pains are going to just increase. Like you know I want it to stop. I would love nothing more than for everything just to stop and get back to normal and for the wars to cease. But Jesus alone, when he comes, he is going to cause the wars to cease. When the Lord rules and reigns on this earth, all the wars are going to cease. There will be peace on earth in his government and his kingdom. But all of these things must come to pass. And right now, this train, these trains are headed in one direction. And pretty soon, the final destination is going to be there. And you want to make sure you're on the right train. Okay? Because we are in the end times. So it's time for people to get aboard. Get on board. Okay? And wake up. Wake up from our sleep because we're sleeping on the train. Right? Sometimes when the train ride seems so long, we're sleeping. Right? And we fall asleep. But what happens when you're on a train? Sometimes there's a preacher. Sometimes there's singers. And when as soon as they come, you wake up like you jolt up. 
right? And so there's a, somebody coming on the train right now. We have people, men of God, women of God, calling the church, calling those in this train, the heavenly train, to wake up because we are almost at our final destination. You may be almost at your final destination. Should the Lord tarry, who knows when your time is up? Who knows? The world changed as, you know, I've heard, I listened to a sermon, the world changed in a day, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, it can change, okay? And so now you have people that are on the board of this train, they're singing, they're preaching, they're sharing the message because they want those on board to wake up. You are almost there. So in 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, just briefly, the Apostles Paul, in these chapters, he's speaking to the believers in the Thessalonian church, my throat is dry, who thought they got left behind. They thought the day of the Lord, they thought the day of the Lord had come. And Paul tells them and warns them not to be deceived yet, church, he said. For the day of the, for the day of the Lord, the return of Christ in his time of judgment, he's speaking to this Thessalonian church, had not come yet. So they didn't need to be worried, okay? They didn't need to be afraid. Because what does he says? He warns the church in verse 5 that there will be a falling away. That that time will not come unless there be a falling away first, okay? There will be a falling away from what? From the faith. And the scripture also says that the love of many will grow cold. So the context of when the return of Christ is and in the end times, because lawlessness abounds, the love of many will start to grow cold. And Paul warns us that there is a falling away first before the Antichrist is revealed. Before this man of sin or lawlessness, lawless one comes, who Satan will indwell like a counterfeit Messiah. That's how he's going to deceive the Jews for a few years because they're going to think this is their Messiah, right? And he will try to exalt himself as God in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem. So this is speaking of the latter days of the tribulation period. And what's going to kick off this tribulation period is a treaty with this man of sin or lawless one in Daniel 9, 27, that he, was, he is going to make um, a peace treaty. Or confirm a covenant with many. And so this is what's going to take off what is known as the tribulation period. Or the last seven, period, uh, seven year period in history. It's also known as the period of Jacob's trouble. Where God will turn his attention back on Israel. And if you have been watching the news, Israel has been in the news. And somehow, and I don't think it's a coincidence that they're also involved with this Ukraine and Russia war. Israel was asked to mediate between Ukraine and Russia, right? So the president and the prime minister of Israel was called in to help mediate between these two countries. So in the latter days, the attention of the world is going to go back on Israel, okay? So it's not a coincidence. They're back in the news right now, and they are involved because we are in the last days. And everything that we are seeing right now is the Lord said these things will happen, Okay, these things will happen. So we are inching closer and closer. As I gave this illustration of the train almost at the final destination, we are just a few stops away. Okay, we are a few stops away from the final destination of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would be ready to get off that stop, that we would be awake. And so in Revelation chapter 12, and this is our main text tonight. I know people often have a picture of the book of Revelation that it's scary or that it's intimidating, that it's all doom and gloom, or it's hard to understand. And as we have heard from our pastors, that the revelation, and according to the scripture, revelation means unveiling or the unveiling or the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that there is a blessing. There is a blessing for you when you read this book. There is a blessing when you read this book. So we don't shy away. We don't have to avoid reading this book because, oh, we may not understand. You ask the Holy Spirit to, un un to help you understand. Ask Holy Spirit to open up the scripture to you, to reveal Christ through every single chapter, even through the illustrations, through um, the symbolism that the Holy Spirit is able to cause you to see Jesus in every single verse and in every single chapter because it's the revealing of our Lord Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, right? Revealing who he is as God. It's revealing who he is as king, as ruler, as judge over the earth, as creator, right? As the one with all authority and power, revealing himself in his fullness of his glory, his purposes, and his plan regarding the world, regarding mankind, you and me, and his final judgment upon Satan and all wickedness. And so now Revelation chapter 12 speaks a little bit of the past and of the future, and also of the period known as the Great Tribulation, which is the last three and a half years. And so in verse 1, it says, a great sign. Now this is John who saw this, right? It says he was caught up, he was in the Spirit, right? And only the Spirit can see the things of the Spirit. The flesh is not going to be able to understand the things of the Spirit, right? Spirit reveals Spirit. So the things of the flesh in the flesh, with the world understanding, with without the Spirit of God, we will not be able to understand the things of of the word of God, right? The things of the spirit. But John was in the spirit, right? And the Lord revealed these things to him. And it says he saw a great sign. So his spiritual eyes were open, right? There was no, um, you know, blocker there. Like he was able to see God open his eyes to see the things of what is happening in heaven. And so at this moment in chapter 12, he says a great sign. And I'm going to be reading from the Amplified. And it says a great sign which means a warning of an ominous or frightening future event. So he says he saw a great sign, which means a frightening or ominous future event appeared in heaven. And then he saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, speaking of the Messiah. And she cried out, being in labor, and it talks about this woman being in labor and in birth pains and in pain to give birth. So John again here is seeing this vision in heaven, right? He's seeing the things that, because you see what's happening in heaven is completely different than what is happening on earth. And so it's really important, especially now, especially with all of the things that's being presented to us in the media, with all of the propaganda on all sides that we're hearing, that you don't even know what is true anymore because there is so much propaganda on every, on every side. And Jesus warns us of these things that in the last days, it's it's going to be so much deception, so much deception in everywhere. So we really need to be in the word. We need to be prayerful. We need to be in prayer, right? In community, building up one another in the faith, because when we're together, we can correct one another, right? We have counsel and wisdom. We build each other up. Our iron sharpens iron. But if you're isolated in the body, if you isolate yourself and you're alone, you can be easy prey to the enemy. You know, the enemy can bombard you with all these lies. So it's, it's really important, especially in these last days, that the body of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, comes together as one in the faith, right? Because iron is going to sharpen iron, right? We're going to speak into each other by the Spirit, right? There is going to be a unity of the Spirit. You're going to have discernment to the things that are of God, praying to, together. So this is really important to understand these things, okay? So he's seeing this vision. And it's a great sign. It appeared in heaven and he sees the things of the Spirit. Now the Spirit will reveal Christ and the things of Christ, the things in heaven. And so this woman represents Israel, okay? In the scripture, this woman represents Israel. The woman clothed with the sun, with the, with the moon beneath her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars, which... Some Bible scholars say represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And we know, and clearly that Israel is a sign to the nations. Like the Lord Jesus Christ chose this nation as a sign to the Gentiles, to the world. And it's so amazing that even from beginning to end of this scripture, that God is always going to be faithful to his covenant, to his people. Right In the old covenant, when he made a covenant with Israel, and in the new covenant uh, with our Lord Jesus Christ, the covenant that he purchased with his blood, he will always be faithful to his promises and to his covenant. So in the very beginning, as we read in the book of Genesis, and the promises that God made to the people of Israel, to, his, to this land, to this nation, which he chose to be a sign to the world, as a sign to the Gentiles, that even in the latter days, Israel is still going to be a sign 
That God is still going to turn his attention back to this country and they will mourn for the one whom they had pierced. And they will realize midway through this tribulation that Jesus was their Messiah all along. And he's going to come back in the midst of his people. So you see that even in this chapter, the faithfulness of God, his faithfulness never fails for his people. And so this woman is Israel here. And she was with child, which is the Messiah. The Messiah was born as a Jew, right? He was born in Israel. He chose to use Israel. And as we see in biblical history, we see the travail and the labor pains that really the nation of Israel went through through all of their captivities, through the Assyrian captivity, through the Babylonian captivity, right? When they were conquered by Persia, then the Greek empire infiltrated that region region for a little while. And then when the Messiah came forth, right, in his first coming, they were under Roman occupation. So there's labor pains, right? There was a groaning right? But God heard the groaning. He heard the groaning of his people and he was born in the midst of them under Roman occupation. That groaning, right? The children of Israel, even in Genesis, they were groaning when they were under Egypt and God delivered them. They were groaning when they were in Babylon, waiting, waiting for that release, waiting to return from captivity, waiting for God to, um, to see the promise of God fulfilled and returning to their own land and the faithfulness of God. There's this groaning, right? And the earth is groaning right now. And there's also a groaning in the spirit of the believers. There's this groaning, right? Groaning for our redemption, groaning for the return of the Messiah, groaning like Lot also, right? When he was vexed in his spirit because of all the lawlessness in Sodom, there is this groaning, right? And it says in the scripture that God heard the groanings of his people. He hears our groanings. He hears those cries. And every single time that the people of God, they groaned and they cried out to him in their hearts. Sometimes that groaning is even unexplainable. When you're going through a trial and you're going through something, sometimes you don't even have the words to express the depths of this trial, the depths of what is inside your heart or this wilderness or this thing that you're growing through. So you just, there's a groaning in your heart, but God is so merciful and faithful that in the word of God, every time there was this groaning, God always hears the cries of his people and he always answers. So this woman was with child, the Messiah who was born in Israel. And even in the latter days, we are told in the New Testament that these labor pains that Israel experienced in the scripture, we will all experience these birth pains will increase before the Messiah is revealed in his glory. And so there was another sign of warning that John saw. So he saw the woman. So in the last days, what was the sign in heaven? Israel. That's what, that was a sign in the last days. Israel, what is happening over there with God's people? What is going on over there with God's people? This, I mean, we're all God's children, but you know what I mean. And there was a great fiery red dragon, which is Satan, with seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven royal crowns, or diadems. And it says, his tail swept across the sky and dragged away a third of the stars of heaven and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. So again, another, the second warning sign that John saw was Satan as a red dragon with horns and crowns symbolizing his desire to want to be king, to want to be like a king, to rule. And it says his tail swept across the sky and dragged away the stars of the heaven, which represents the angels, right, that followed him. A third of the angels followed him and flung to the earth those who chose to follow Lucifer. And it says... The dragon stood in front of the woman. Satan opposing the woman or Israel so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And we know what happened, right? When Jesus was born, 
Um, there was an edict to kill him, to kill um, the young men, the young males with Herod. And it says she gave birth to a son. Who is the son? Jesus. Israel gave birth to a son, a male child, who destined to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And so you see the past here. You see that even in Revelation, you have the past, you have the present, you have the future. Right? The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. So even in this chapter, you see the beginning and the end. You see the story. You see the work and the plan of God. Right? She gave birth to a son. Jesus Christ was born amongst his people. And he was destined to rule. That word rule, it also means to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 19.15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, sword. So that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So Jesus will rule and reign in authority. And it says that her child or Speaking of Jesus Christ, our Lord was caught up to God and to his throne. So he is there right now. So now this is the present. This is saying, uh, talking about Jesus who is seated on the throne. Right? He came from the woman and then he was caught up and he is seated on the throne where he is right now. And in Acts those angels, the two angels told the disciples the same way that you saw Jesus get caught up into the heavens is the same way you are going to see him come back. So he was caught up to heaven in a cloud and seated on the throne and then he will come back in the clouds. That he will come back the way that they had seen him leave. And so the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, Israel, speaking of Israel, so that she would be nourished there for 1,260 days, or basically three and a half years. So now at this point, in verse 6, this jumps to the midpoint of this seven-year tribulation period, where Israel will undergo severe persecution and tribulation, such like they have never seen before. And all of those who are alive and there at the time who choose to follow Christ... And they will see that he is not their Messiah. And the Antichrist will turn on them. And then it says Israel will go into the wilderness. And many Bible scholars say that at this point, they will, you know, many Bible scholars agree that they will actually hide and flee to Petra. If you've ever seen um, um, that that place in Jordan, Petra. Um, So it's like the walls and it's like you go inside. Um, So Bible scholars believe that's where um, the Israelites or the Jewish people will go and hide in the wilderness, in Petra, um, during the last three and a half years. But you see that even during this time, even in the midst of tribulation, even in the midst of trouble, you see God providing for and protecting his people, that he made a way, he's making a way for them to escape. He says they're going to flee into the wilderness, where what? She had a place prepared by God. That God even... Even now, this is not the tribulation yet, but even now God has a place already prepared for them. And he tells what his disciples in the New Testament, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, right? You have a place prepared by God for you. We all have a place prepared by God for us. And when Jesus comes back, he will bring us to this place that he has prepared for us. Right, And so as he's prepared a place for the bride of Christ, for the church of Jesus Christ, he actually has a physical place prepared for the children of Israel. Even in the midst of the raging of the storms, even in the midst of the earth being shaken, because during this tribulation period, there will be shaking on the earth like we've never experienced it before. And I'm not even exaggerating. When you read Revelation, it will be a shaking. Okay? It will be like... Like nothing we have ever seen before. But even in the midst of that time, you see that God is able to keep his people. He has a place already prepared for them before they even went there, right? To keep them in that place. God always makes a way and protects and he doesn't forget his covenant. 
And so in verse 7, a war broke out in heaven. Michael the archangel and his angels waging war with the dragon who was Satan. The dragon and his angels fought, but they were not strong enough and did not prevail. So Satan did not prevail. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. So they were kicked out of heaven at this point. Because you know, throughout the scriptures, you see how Satan comes before God to accuse the saints. He came before the presence of God to accuse Job. He came before God to accuse Joshua in the book of Zechariah in chapter 3. Okay, so then he's going to get kicked out. Him and his angels are kicked out of heaven. But it says a war broke out. And Michael, the archangels, and the, the angelic army along with Michael, waged war against Satan. And Satan and his angels and his, um, you know, the demons with him did not prevail. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, speaking also of this same time, that Michael, speaking of the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people and there shall be a time of trouble this is Jacob's trouble this is the tribulation period such as it says a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people shall be delivered right so they will be delivered when Jesus Christ Jesus Christ steps foot in um, Israel once again when he returns And so even in these verses, in 7 to 9, you see that God has no rival, right? Often we think that Jesus and Satan are rivals, that Satan is the rival of Jesus, but he's not, right? Satan was an archangel. He was an angel in heaven. So the rival of Satan is Michael the archangel, right? Because God has no rival, Right? Jesus has no rival. There is no one equal to him. There's no one who can even be on his level. Right? There's no one on his level. In power, in authority, in might, in wisdom, in knowledge, he has no rival. And so I love this scripture because you see that Jesus has no rival. And sometimes when we're being attacked, we think that the enemy is coming in like a flood and we're being overwhelmed, right? And that the enemy is getting the upper hand. But when we read the scriptures and we're being reminded that Jesus has no rival. And if you're going through something and you're being touched or you're being attacked or whatever opposition, right? Or spiritual warfare, the Lord uses that. He's like a, it's like a tool in the Lord's hand to train our hands for war, to train our hands to fight, right? To make us stronger to build us up but Jesus has no rival and the dragon did not prevail against Michael the archangel so Michael the archangel fights against Satan not Jesus they're below Satan is below right under his feet Even in Genesis, he will crush Satan's head. And this is a reason to rejoice because we see in Revelation, we need a reason to rejoice. The church, we have to start looking to these things. Okay, we have to start looking to our our heads up for our redemption draws nigh. This is our blessed hope. This is a reason to give us hope, to give us, this is our purpose because we are on this train and we are getting towards the people of God are towards their final destination, right? And so when everything around us is being shaken and you see wars and rumors of wars and you see falling away and you see deception and false prophets and all of these things that the Lord warned us about, what do we look to? Who do we look to? What do we focus on? What we need to see, what John saw, he had a heavenly vision. He had eyes to see and ears to hear what is going on in the spirit. God give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And when we're on this train, that we're not, when we're looking out the train window, right? When you're on the subway or you're on the seven train, you don't see flushing anymore. You don't see like, um, you know, city field anymore. You see heaven around you. You see eternity. You see the word of God being fulfilled. So you look at everything with the lens of scripture. You see everything now in the eyes of the word of God. That Lord, you told me these things will come to pass through your word. Lord, I see this. This is your plan. You are still in control. You are still at work. You are building up your church, God. Your church will prevail. We will overcome them by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Loving not our lives unto the death. 
right? And he's preparing his church that we are going to be a bride without spot, without wrinkle, that it's him who cleanses us. He's going to, he's giving us robes. He's given us robes, white robes, new garments without spot, without wrinkle, right? And he's telling the church, get ready because the wedding is coming soon. And I've heard it said recently, while the world is looking for a war, while the world is preparing for war, the church is preparing for a wedding. And that is the wedding feast of the Lamb. That is what we're preparing for. That is what we look to. That at the forefront of everything, yes, we do all of these things. We work and we take care of our children and we go to the grocery. But really, at at the forefront of everything is the will of God, the purposes of God, the plan of God. So when everything, these things are happening, you are not caught off guard. You are not shaken. Because we're continually exhorted to not be shaken, be sober, be vigilant. Because your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, be watchful, right? Be watchful, be watchman, be watchwoman, be waiting, be sober in these times. Because these are the days of lawlessness around us. And these are days of deception. And so we need eyes, like John had eyes to see in the spirit, that while there's wars going on right now, like at this point, this is a tribulation period, war is breaking out, there's chaos, right? The Antichrist is on the scene and whatever it is. But in heaven, it says they're starting to rejoice. There's a rejoicing in heaven because God sees what we don't see. He's eternal. And those in heaven have a front row seat. Our loved ones in heaven have a front row seat. That's why when it says there's a great cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on, right? There is a great cloud of witnesses. Our loved ones in heaven cheering us on. They can cheer because they know, they see, they see the finished work. They see everything. Their eyes are completely open. They see the end from the beginning. They see the fullness of Jesus Christ and his victory. They see, and they know without a doubt that Satan has been defeated, that Jesus Christ will rule and reign. And so there's a rejoicing in heaven in this passage of scripture. It says in verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven during this time. When even when Satan on earth is, you know, trying to, um, he knows his time is short. So he's unleashing his wrath. He's persecuting the people of God on earth. And there's tribulation and persecution. In heaven, it says, saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom, dominion, reign of our God and the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser. So they see, they see now from this perspective. And so that's why, you know, it's a blessing when we read Revelation, because we see when you read Revelation, you know the end story. You know how the story ends. We know, we know what what they're doing right now in heaven. We know what's going to take place. So we don't look with the eyes of the flesh and we don't see in what they're trying to show us all over the news and social media of all of these things. You see in the spirit, God's victory, God's salvation for people, the salvation and the power and the kingdom, dominion, reign of our God, the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down at last. He who accuses them and keeps bringing charges against them before our God day and night. So in heaven, salvation, power, kingdom, authority of Christ, what? Not will come, it says has come. The kingdom has come. Salvation has come. Power of our Lord Jesus Christ has come. Power to redeem, power to save, power to heal, power to restore, power to renew, power to refresh, power to change your heart, power to change our mind, power to enable us to walk a holy life, power to enable us to forgive, to love, to humble ourselves before God and before one another. Power. Through the Holy Spirit, kingdom, and his authority. 
that we don't walk in our own authority. When you share the gospel, it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's going to be by his authority. The disciples were giving power by the Holy Spirit, authority to preach the gospel. It's a commandment. It's a call. You preach the gospel. You preach, rebuke, exhort with, not with our own authority, but you have the spirit of the living God backing you up inside of you, through you, in you. And the accuser, they saw that the accuser has been cast down. And it says, this accuser of the brethren, Satan, he brings charges against the saints and the people of God day and night. So day and night, it's like he's working overtime. He's working overtime right now because he knows his time is short. He knows he's going to be crushed soon forever. He knows he's going to be chained forever. He knows our Lord Jesus Christ will bruise his head. He knows his time is up. But in this short time he has, on this earth, in the lawlessness, he's working overtime. In the bringing what? How is he working overtime in the church? Accusations. Accusations. Like he did with Job. Accusations. Like he did with um, Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3. Let's go there really quick because... In Zechariah chapter 3, it's talking about Joshua the high priest at the time when they were, when I shared last week about, or two weeks ago with Haggai, when they were starting to rebuild the temple, Joshua was the high priest there. And it says in verse 1, and it says, then he showed me, this is the prophet Zechariah saying, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And it says what? Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan... The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. So the Lord rebukes the devil. We have no power in ourselves to rebuke anything or do anything. But it's by the Spirit of God. It's the Lord. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord silence you, Satan. Because the Lord says, it says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, and it says Joshua the high priest, he was clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments. And he said to him, and this is, I believe this is the Lord, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing right by. So you see, even in Zechariah with Joshua, the high priest who was called, what was the high priest called to do? Come before the presence of God, right? On behalf of people to minister in the presence of God, to meet with God in the Holy of Holies. And what is Satan doing standing by there? Accusing him. You have no right to stand before the presence of God. Oh, you have no right to be here in the Holy of Holies. Look what you did in your past. Look at your failures. Look at your garments. They're stained, right? You have filthy garments. They're not worthy to be here in the Holy of Holies. Look at your past. Look at your failures. Look what you did yesterday. Satan is an accuser. You see it in Zechariah. We see it. This is how he tries to get you. And you don't even realize, but those are thoughts going into your mind. And you think those thoughts are your thoughts, but those are arrows, lies from the pits of hell to condemn you, accuse you, slander, and bring you under so you won't, so you don't even go there. So you're going to be like, oh, yeah, agreeing, agreeing with the lies. Don't agree with the lies. Don't agree with the lies of the enemy. Don't agree with that. We don't have to agree with that, right? He's given us new garments. He's taken away our filthy garments, right? And he's made us white as snow. So by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's why I praise God for that song that Pastor D sang. You know, I come to the Holy of Holies by the blood of the Lamb, that we can come by the blood of the Lamb. We come by garments that are spotless. You can come in the Holy of Holies tonight with garments that are clean, that are white as snow, that we can cast off every accusation, every condemnation, every slander, because that's how we get to the people of God. Satan standing by to accuse Joshua the high priest before the Lord, right? Accusation, condemnation, slander. But I praise God because it was the Lord who clothed him with new garments. 
And it was the Lord who rebuked the enemy, who silences the enemy. That because of Jesus Christ, because of what he's done, right? He is our mediator, our intercessor. We can, you can, we can come before his presence into the Holy of Holies, right? By the blood of the Lamb, meaning him, hearing from him tonight, knowing that we are white as snow, that our past is the past, right? That we don't have to be condemned because that's one way the enemy tries to snare the people of God through, you know, those lies of the enemy, through past failures, through the past, through even using other things or people or situations. But we know the spirit behind it is really the devil to accuse us. But praise God, it's the Lord who defends us. It's the Lord who defended Joshua. What did he say when Satan said that? The Lord rebuke you. Jesus, we don't have to defend ourselves. In any situation, the Lord is our defender. He fights for us. He fights our battles and he will fight our battles tonight. If you're going through a battle tonight, spiritually, mentally, with whatever situation, I praise God that we can come before the Holy of Holies tonight, knowing and seeing and reading these things in Revelation, that our Lord Jesus Christ is seated on the throne, that he is all power, all authority, that he rebukes the enemy, that the enemy has cast out. And it says they have overcome by the blood of the lamb, right? Again, the blood of the lamb. I pray that we would never get tired, Lord, of the blood of the lamb, of speaking of the blood, right? Of singing of the blood, that the cross would always be on the forefront of our minds. We have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And really our testimony is not us in ourselves. It's the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ in and through our lives. It's his testimony, right? His faithfulness in your life, his grace in your life. Psalm 139, 23 to 24, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. And let this be our prayer tonight. As we come before God's presence, let this be our prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And it's so amazing. If you see there's a wicked way in me, he doesn't say, I'm going to turn you away. It says, he leads us into the way everlasting. You know? Satan condemns, he sees the wicked way, and he wants you to stay in that wicked way, away from the presence of God. But God, because of what he's done for us, see the wicked way in me, any wicked way, and he leads us into the way everlasting, right? Into truth, into righteousness. He cleanses us and washes us clean. So we overcome, we overcome by the blood of the, of the Lamb. The blood never loses its power. The blood that was poured out for you and for me, that removes the edict that was against us, the blood that makes our hearts and our minds new. We need a refreshing. I believe people tonight need a refreshing. They need to be refreshed in the presence of the Lord. Refreshing is not going to come, you know, with any other thing. Real refreshing water to your soul. Because Jesus only gives the living water. He alone is the living water. You're thirsty. You're thirsty tonight. I'm thirsty tonight. And the only one that can satisfy our thirst is the living water. And he says, drink of this cup. We can drink of the fountain of living waters. It's a fountain. It's a fountain available for us. Right? Right? Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. So all of those who dwell in the heavens are rejoicing. Those in the presence of God are rejoicing. But woe to the earth in this time and the sea, because the devil has come down to you in great wrath, knowing he has a short time remaining. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, speaking of Israel, that will endure um, a purifying They will endure a refining, the discipline, but it's for their good. So his persecution will just intensify. And those who believe in Christ during that time will be martyred for their faith. That's real. This is scripture. In the tribulation period, the people who choose not to bow to the Antichrist 
and the beast system are going to be martyred for their faith. Just like the disciples were in the book of Acts. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place. It says, so this, she was nourished for a time and times and a half. So really this is the last three and a half years where the, where the Lord shows mercy upon his people. Where he leads them into the wilderness where they are protected. A remnant of people will go into the wilderness during this time of intense persecution and tribulation. So these things are not taking place yet, but Revelation 12, it will take place. Like I said at the beginning, we are on the end times train, and there are few stops left before our final destination. And sometimes when you're on the train, some people are anxious, ready, to, they're just like, you notice when you're, you know your stop is left, some people already get up early, they're already standing by the door, they're holding on to the pole because they just cannot wait to get out. Right? So there are some believers who are up, they're already up, they're not even there yet, but they just cannot wait. They just cannot wait to get out of here. (laughs) They're like, let's go, let's go. Right? There's some who are just, you know, just, they're awake, but they're sitting there. But there's some who are asleep, and they don't even know what stop is going on. (laughs) They don't even hear the preacher on the thing, because they don't even know what's happening on the train. They don't even know what stop it is. And sometimes they wake up and they're like, wait, what stop are we? That's happened to me. Right? And there's some who got mistaken and were taken off the, they got off the train for a little while. And they got lost. And they took the other train by accident. Right? But the Lord is just like, get back. Get back on the train. Because there's a few stops left. We're almost there. We see what's happening around us. Uh, it's really like, it's, it, I don't even know why I act surprised, honestly, because every time, like sometimes I follow up with news and articles, literally every single day I'm reading something, but you know, you have to have a balance. You don't want to o- overwhelm yourself. But each day it's always like something new that lines up with the Word of God. Things that are happening in Europe, things that are happening in Israel, even in America. The Bible says there's going to be famines. The Bible says there's going to be pestilence. The Bible says these things are coming. They already passed, uh, I I believe it's an executive order to start um, pursuing or looking into digital currency or digital wallet. You know? just like they're doing in China. So cashless society, everything is digital. AI technology, that's how the beast system is going to operate, through digital, through artificial intelligence. And so there was an executive order to already, for the federal government to start pursuing um, digital currencies, cryptocurrencies. We see the, the formulation and the coming together of this beast system that's been prophesied to us in the last days. So if we see these things coming to pass, church, we're on the train. We're on the train. And I pray that we would we would all be like rushing just to get out that door. We would be awake. And not only that, let's call other people. Get on this train with us. Get off that other train. Get off the platform. Get off the platform. Sometimes you get distracted when you're on the platform. You see somebody singing, right? You see people doing performances. But the Lord is calling us. Get back on the train. We see these things happening. And so I'm going to close with this in Titus chapter 2. This is just practical instruction from Paul in the book of Titus. How we should be living. It says, for the grace of God in chapter 2 verse 11. That brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us, all of us, that Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should what? One, live soberly. Live soberly, that means being watchful, righteously, and godly in this present age. Looking for what? In verse 13, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, his church, a special people. What? Zealous for good works. So it's not wrong to be zealous. We can be zealous for what? Good works. And then Paul says, we are instructed here, speak these things. 
right? So while we're on this end time train and we're, we see these things coming to pass, right? We see a glimpse of what will happen. And as we've just read in Revelation 12, what should we do? Exhort, speak about these things, Paul says. Speak about the salvation of God. Speak about the grace that's been offered to all of us. All of us is given a ticket to enter the train and it's free and the price isn't going to go up like the gas, right? It's free for all of us. Exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one despise you. And I promise this is the last thing to encourage us as we pray tonight. As um, I didn't make this up, I saw this um, through one uh, commentary and he wrote this. Speaking of Jesus, he came the first time to save the soul of man. He will come a second time to resurrect the body. He came the first time to save the individual. He will come a second time to save society. He came the first time to a crucifixion. He will come a second time to a coronation. He came the first time to a tree. He will come a second time to a throne, physically. He came the first time in humility. He will come a second time in glory. He came the first time and was judged by men. And he will come a second time to judge all men. He came the first time and stood before Pilate. He will come a second time and Pilate will stand before him. Let's close. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God for your word. And I pray, Lord God, that as we have read um, a chapter in the book of Revelation tonight, and as your people read your word, I pray that you would bless them, that there would be a blessing tonight upon your people, a special blessing, a revelation of you, Lord, as John had eyes to see, spiritual eyes to see these things going on in the heaven, that heaven was rejoicing, at your work, at your power, at your victory. Lord, I pray that the church would have the same shout in our hearts tonight, Lord God. That we don't look at the things that are seen, but we look to the things that are unseen. So Lord, as we gather together in your name, let us pray with faith tonight, Lord God. Let us pray knowing we stand on the side of victory tonight. Let us pray knowing, Lord God, that the accuser of the brethren has and will be cast down forever, Lord God. Let us pray knowing tonight, Lord God, that, Lord, you have no rival, my Jesus. No rival. No one compares to you, Lord God. You have all authority and power, Lord God. And so let us pray, my God, I pray. Let us pray with this faith. Let us pray with boldness. Let us pray with assurance tonight to know, Lord Jesus, that you have already won the victory. And let it be real. Let us see it as John saw it, Lord God. Not with the eyes of our own understanding, Lord. Not with our emotions, but with the Spirit. Reveal it to your church, O God. Encourage your people, Lord. Wake us up, my God. Wake up your church, Lord God. Wake up your people, Lord. And stir our hearts for you once again, Lord. We love you so much, Lord Jesus. And I thank you that even when we're faithless, you remain faithful. I thank you, Lord God, that when our hearts condemn us, You are greater than our hearts. I thank you when Satan is accusing people tonight. When he's accusing and he's been accusing and condemning people. You say, the Lord rebuke you. You rebuke the enemy, Lord God. And silence him, Lord. Cause your people to know your victory and your power and your healing. And your grace and your restoration. To walk as a son and daughter of the Most High God. To know our position in you. To know the authority and the place and the position that we have as sons and daughters of the Most High. That we can walk uprightly tonight knowing that our God is with us and goes before us. And that you have won the victory, Lord. God, we thank you. Only you can make this word such a reality to us, Lord. Only you can do it, Lord. So, Lord, we, I give this all back to you. All back to you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.